in each one of us there is a balance between our cognitive state and our affective state it's easier and it is more primal to give in to our affective states hi humans today we're going outside of your comfort zone Comfort might be defined as a state of physical ease and freedom from pain, which is a totally seductive goal. Who in their right mind wouldn't want to be warm, cozy, safe, and entertained? But what if we told you that orienting yourself to comfort as a highest value might be a big part of what makes you so anxious, lonely, and depressed? Comfort seeking seems perfectly natural. Look to the animals that surround you. Birds gladly move into houses humans make for them. Squirrels will gorge themselves on nuts people leave out. Pets love their cozy furry beds. And much of the human technological evolution from fire to electricity and indoor plumbing can be seen as a very intentional pursuit of progressively more comfortable circumstances. As more and more humans live in places where their most basic needs like food, shelter and water are taken care of, they tend to spend more and more money on the feel good economy. Things like Netflix, alcohol, video games, Apple gadgets, tobacco products, marijuana, cocaine, and fast food all tickle the dopamine centers of the brain. And when everything is just a click away, things get weird. Amazon will deliver almost anything overnight. The big box superstore shelves are full of cheap trinkets that spruce up cookie cutter apartments. Takeouts just a click away and weekly drone deliveries are just around the corner. The products of a global industrial civilization are within arm's reach, so why are so many people still so unhappy? To be clear, there's nothing actually wrong with buying things, taking drugs, or even eating fast food. The problem really comes down to the fact that when you give in to the animal desire for comfort and you aim at peak security, you're most likely going to lose your mind. You might find that shopping, drugs, and fast food start out as a supplement to living, socializing, and eating, but slowly grow to replace those things. Like all living systems, humans habituate over time. And as populations get wealthier and farther and farther away from a state of nature, people get really habituated to convenience. Not having to go get water from the well or having to deal with your trash or having to take public transportation to get somewhere all become part of the weave and weft of life. But just because things are already comfortable, houses are air-conditioned, there's a car in nearly every garage, a fridge in every house, it's not like people look around and acknowledge that they've already made it big and don't need any more. Instead, the monster gets even stronger because it can actually seem like there's a final destination rather than just a mirage on the horizon. Disposable income gets poured into the pursuit of ease and with each step in that direction, the perceived benefits actually fade into the background. Think about it. If someone below the poverty line gets a car, that's a huge life-changing improvement. They can get to work, pick up their kids, go to the grocery store and doctor's office, all without having to wait for a bus that never arrives. But the person who already has two cars and wants to get a third or fourth? Well, what's it going to change? They can pick a different Porsche to take to the racetrack on alternating weekends? This comfort ceiling can be thought of as a form of the hedonic treadmill, where increases in comfort are quickly absorbed as a new baseline and act like a furnace that constantly needs to be fed. This is pretty obviously the case in a place like the United States, where 80% of adults own a smartphone, upwards of 90% of households own cars, but there's still widespread anxiety, depression, and loneliness. If increasing material comfort was tied to psychological well-being, then we'd expect to see the opposite of this. This becomes even more dire when you realize it's impossible to create a completely comfortable world, since lots of things can't be controlled. There's always going to be some numbskull on the corner who says something to get under your skin, or the contrarian just looking for an inflammatory viewpoint, or even just an idea that you don't particularly care for. And under these circumstances, the search for reassurance can leave the searcher feeling hollow, empty, and unfulfilled. Obviously, the exact point of inflection between sufficient comfort and hedonic treadmill is pretty unclear. It's safe to say that it's somewhere after a constant supply of electricity, food, shelter, community, and health, and before you put down the deposit on that third gold toilet. Most people live somewhere in that gray area and are psychologically consumed by the search for increasing safety. Yet, there's real hope. There's an idea making waves in science and society alike, and that's to simply refuse to optimize for comfort at the expense of all else. Quite counterintuitively, dealing with sadness, anxiety, and depression might require leaning into discomfort hard. 
Earth scientists are beginning to realize that doing difficult things, intentionally, carefully, wisely, is the best way to create a life that's free of those prototypical spiritual ailments. This isn't just the domain of the self-help section of your local bookstore. There's a rich vein of traditions that suggests embracing suffering will put you on a path to a better life. There's a host of religious figures across all cultures, monks, pilgrims, saints, ascetics, prophets, that embody this principle. Discovering a life-sustaining religious fire might not be on the menu for most, but finding simple ways to embrace suffering might do the trick just as well. The benefits of controlled suffering is modeled by the concept of hormesis. A little bit of a bad thing might actually be quite good for you. And this is apparent in some pretty prosaic things like weightlifting, where micro tears in the muscles make them grow bigger. But ripping a tendon will put you in the hospital. Psychological stress too can be a good thing. The spark of facing the unknown can help you focus and learn better, but chronic grinding stress will most likely wreck you, eventually. A heart attack or perhaps stress-induced inflammation that breeds cancer, diabetes, and neurodegeneration. The benefits of stress are also apparent in some weirder things. Exposure to radiation at very low levels seems to be protective from cancer. The mechanism isn't very clear, but it might be that some radiation kills dysfunctional cells before they actually become cancerous and do far more damage. Small quantities of starvation, like intermittent fasting, appear to extend lifespan through a decrease in caustic metabolic byproducts. But full-blown hunger causes death. All of these can be seen as a form of exposure therapy, where being subjected to small quantities of something bad teaches the body how to mitigate physical and molecular damage. More and more, this kind of treatment is finding purchase in the mainstream for everything from stage fright to deadly peanut allergies. Controlled exposure to a stressor, pure discomfort, is the surest path towards becoming a stronger, more resilient, more motivated human being. Developing a practice of doing arbitrarily difficult things, like making your bed, handling spiders, taking cold showers, all forces you to overcome an emotional aversion to discomfort. Over time, this trains the willpower muscles, metaphorically speaking, so that you can do increasingly difficult things without giving in to the emotional aversion that surrounds them. You begin to believe that you can do what used to seem impossible, and that's an unbelievable antidepressant, anxiolytic, and stimulant. One way to practice doing deeply unpleasant things is the Wim Hof method, where practitioners use deep breathing, breath holds, meditation, and exposure to cold to build willpower. Wim Hof, the Iceman, was inspired by yogic breathing and tumo meditation. And he's done things that seem to go beyond the human ability. He's climbed Kilimanjaro in his shorts, sat in a tank of ice for nearly two hours, run a marathon across the Namib desert without water, set world records in under ice swimming, and has demonstrated an ability to consciously control his immune system. Scientists have studied Wim Hof and have shown that his abilities are both quantifiable and can be taught to others. In the conversation that follows, we talk to Vaibhav Diwadkar, a professor of neuropsychiatry at Wayne State, about his work on Wim Hof and what his abilities say about the nature of happiness and habituation, the ways in which our thinking shapes how we experience the world, and the necessity of self-control in avoiding corrupt incentive structures at every step in society. Subscribe so you don't miss all the earthling conversations we've got on deck in the coming weeks. And it is quite the collection. Moral psychology, the spiritual economy of modern life, space agriculture, the politics of strongmen, cyber warfare, and even another conversation about Wim Hof and his incredible abilities. Yep. So add your own thoughts in the comments section or meet up with us on Facebook. Demystifying science. Ooh, ooh.